Hi again, everybody. Dave Stevens here joining you from the home offices here in uh, Bristol, Connecticut. And uh, it is great to be here again uh, this evening. Uh, we have a great show for you. Get ready to laugh a lot uh, and not at the face of my co-host that I'm about to bring in. Uh, of course, joining me uh, on the Steve, uh, Geary Stein and Stevens show is Troy Geary. Thank you, Troy, for popping in again. Uh, Will still on assignment. I guess he's recovering from the uh, Hall of Fame, but uh, it's good to have you here. How's things in Minnesota tonight? Uh, things are great, Dave. I've been excited for the show today. Yeah, it's going to be a great show. And uh, tonight's guest is going to, well, it's probably going to, you know, make people laugh, make people cry. He's a guy that's, uh, you know, you, you see him in a lot of things. You've, you, you kind of look at him and go, I, I know who that guy is. I just, I just can't place him. But uh, tonight our guest is Seth Herzog. He is a comedian who has uh, been doing a lot of work for a long time. You you may have seen him on television shows like 30 Rock. Um, he's always a guest as a, a uh, he writes skits and participates in uh, uh, when Conan O'Brien was on the air. And uh, of course, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon transitioned into the Tonight Show with uh, Jimmy Fallon still. So let me bring in, without further ado, hi, Seth. How are you? Hey We're just How watching you? some of your old bits. I uh, noticed you can... You can sort of hear me underneath your, what you're saying, but that first clip, you have no idea how dirty it is. Oh, you I do. That's me why I, me. <laughs> I kept it really, really low because you kept after that one low, after yeah. having John Rocker on last week, where we didn't really have the FCC actually came to my house afterwards for all the four letter foul letters and everything he did. I love the, but, uh, the idea that the FCC makes a house call. It's like, well, yeah, well, you guys yeah. really went overboard tonight. Hey, you know, when you use a lot of derogatory F-bombs and things, but, you know, right. you can say whatever you want here and you can do whatever you want as we take a look at some of the great skits that you do, you put on. This was a, this, this was this really one, funny. This one was a, a um, funny or die bit. I did like a bunch of funny or die stuff in New York with the same directors, uh, Brandon Leganke and uh, John, this last name I'm spacing. And um, that was the biggest hit, that basketball one was like a Who's giant for hit for them well, it, this it, is it, this is insane yeah so is, ifc just, ifc had me go to different places oh and just God. set up a mic and start doing stand-up and this was at a pizza place <laughs> in williamsburg <laughs> and everyone immediately left <laughs> well it was so absurd that's what i mean you know you you see the stuff and, and i know you've been doing it for a long long time yeah, I know, yeah, uh, yeah you know yeah, we, yeah. we we we're talking years and years and years and years in fact uh some of your early stuff if if you dig into the vaults and and you do your your due diligence of, of working me. super hard oh. Oh, oh that's oh, wendy's 99 yeah. cent quarter pound double stack yeah. that comes that way i'll tell you no way this look at that oh. hair yeah is there a problem oh, here Wendy's quarter pound double yeah, stack is such a great a deal at 99 cents. 90 Some people find it hard to believe. Before so I you see, it comes with two patties of beef. Yeah, I, I, I looked at it and I was like, holy cow, nice hair, first off. I know. Uh, secondly, I it looked hair. like it looked like you were channeling your inner Steve Gutenberg there. So ah, I know, I wish. Uh, you know. G Gutenberg wishes he had that hair. Anyway, <laughs> um, I had, yeah, I was, I was a year out of college and I was living in Jersey still and I was growing my hair kind of long and that was the only year I did it. I cut my hair short the following year, it's been short ever, ever since. I had like one year of like long hair and that ad was the second commercial I ever auditioned for. And uh, it was this Wendy's ad with, you know, Dan Thomas, is that his name? Dave, Dave Thomas. Dave Thomas. Yeah. And Dave had his lines. He had two, three lines. And they were on the counter written out in big letters because he couldn't remember them. And he was really upset with my long hair. He kept making jokes about it throughout the takes that I need to get a haircut and that we should give me a haircut. And the director came out and said, no, we like it long. That's part of the character. It's part of the bit is that he has long hair. He's like, all right, but can we get a haircut for this guy? Seriously. Um, and I remember walking into the dressing room before we shot and I said, uh, I introduced myself. He's there with his like buddies who are all about his age. And I just said, Hey, I'm Seth. I'm doing the commercial with you today. And he goes, you some big actor. I said, I'm about five ten. No <laughs> one laughs. He looks at his friend. He goes, the guy thinks he's a comedian. <laughs> it was just, it was just a funny, weird day. Oh, one more, one more little story about Dave Thomas. So he was talking about how he drives from Florida to Columbus, Ohio and back. That's where he has his homes. And he never flies. He doesn't like flying and he drives. So I said, so how often do you just drop in at like a Wendy's on the road? He goes, I've never done that. 
<laughs> I said, what? You got it. And I convinced him. I was like, this drive that you're about to do to drive to Florida, you have to stop in at a, a Wendy's and say hi. Like people blow, they get their minds blown. You're like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and one little known, day. before yeah. Troy jumps in, one little known fact. You filmed that, I think, in 1993, if I was yeah. correct? Yeah. Sadly, because of your interaction with Dave Thomas, he died nine years later. Nine years later. So I, I wondered if you upset him so much that he lived with that turmoil and just dropped dead one day. I know he dropped dead. No, he was a fun guy to work with. He was just very, he really didn't like doing it. <laughs> I could definitely tell that he wasn't happy doing it. He was like, this, I got to do this. I don't really like doing it. It's my thing. He does. He didn't re like remember the lines. He wanted to leave immediately. <laughs> Great. You know? Who are some of your uh, comedic influences that you have kind of took things from over the years? So or many. Is it just, or just a Seth? No, my God. I am an amalgamation of anyone I've, I've, I've ever seen. Um, I mean, like, I'll find myself doing a joke on stage and I'll find myself falling into, like, Eddie Pepitone, you know, or who else? Occasionally a Mulaney. I'm like, I mean, um, Mike Showalter, who's a big director now from the state. Him and I have been friends since we were six. So I'll occasionally find myself doing a delivery like Mike would do it. I mean, it's different people. You know, depending on the joke, depends on, and how the joke goes, depends on how I deliver it, like whose voice I end up doing by accident. And I try to change it. And I'll be like, I can't do that. I got to do my own thing. And Seth, you know, I know as a comedian, it, it's, it's tough. You've watched the evolution of, you know, dirty comedians, offensive comedians, you know, the, um, all of them, you know, dice clay type guys, you know, what, what now as a comedian is, is off limits as a topic to joke about. I mean, it depends on who you ask and what their own limitations are and what they think the audience's limitations are, you know, like I used to do a, a, a Tracy Morgan impression and now other comics are telling me you really shouldn't be doing that on stage. You know, the people might not like it or would come off the wrong the wrong way. I mean, I I only write jokes I'm comfortable with. I write jokes I'm comfortable saying. And if you write jokes that are good and you're comfortable in your own skin saying them, most of the time people in the audience will let it go if they enjoy it. The only thing I stay away from, the only topic I just stay away from in general is a woman's weight. There's never going to win as a guy talking about a woman's weight, you know? That's the only thing. Everything else is fine as long as it's a clever joke. And sometimes it may be, if often if you're the butt of the joke, that's the best thing. I mean, often I have, I've, I'll often joke about things that are sensitive topics, but you joke about how we react to them. Like if there's a tragedy or a shooting or something like that, you know, I, I will, I won't shy away from it, but I won't joke about the incident. But I'll joke about how we react to it as a culture. That's the joke. The joke is us and what the things people say and how they react to it. Like the school shootings, you know, like the fact that the Republicans think the doors are the problem. Like literal, literal senators go on the air and talk about, well, if they had less doors, there'd be a lot less shootings. Are you serious right now? Doors is the issue? Anyway, I mean, things like things like that. How did the idea of having your mom uh, do stand up with you start? That started in 01. I was performing regularly and producing a weekly show called The Industry Room. Uh, in started in 01. It was a very popular weekly show for about a year and a half with, um, who was in that? I'm spacing everyone's name. John Viner and Josh Weinstein and um, Ophira Eisenberg. And... My mom would, was living in Manhattan and d desperate for stuff to do. She just was like in her apartment. So she'd come and watch the show all the time. And the first time she came and watched the show, I thought I'd do a funny bit where I would only tell stories about her. I was like, this is whole set's going to be just stories about my mom. And then I'd call her up at the end of the set because the audience didn't know she was there. And then she would refute the stories. She'd be like, okay, here's why everything you're saying is wrong. You know, and that's how that started. Basically, well, it worked, and then we got dancing and doing all kinds of things. It worked out pretty well for you, and and you know, yeah. 
I've done a lot of neat, cool things in my life. And mm -hmm. uh, one of my greatest experiences last year was actually doing stand up, uh, you know, in front of a crowd. I call Amazing. it sit down because my yeah. ass is on the ground. And, right. you know, I'd never been so nervous. And, and I want your perspective of, you know, I'm looking out at the audience and, and you are telling a joke and people aren't laughing or they're not getting it. Does it get in your mind? Do I do the next joke? How do I save this, you know, this crowd? Do I care? Am I just going to work through my stuff? You know, it, it was fun. I did about eight minutes, uh, right. you know, penis on the ground jokes, stuff like that, that really killed. But, uh, yeah. you know, for you, those experiences, you know, on the stage, I mean, it's got to be tough because when you, when you're up there all alone, it, it's it's just you. Yet, it's just you. You're you know, like a boxer. If or you're like bombing, a you're looking at faces. Player, yeah. Are are you reading the people in the room? Like what happens? I mean, it happens all the all the time in different ways. I did a show in Montauk last week for a lot of people that I know, a lot of friends of mine who are out there. We did a I did a big summer summer show. It was like a private show for people who kind of know me, and maybe that was a mistake because they weren't really laughing. They're like, we we get it. Next, you know, so it was like the first few minutes were kind of like weird, awkward. And then, you know, the truth is people love to be in on a spontaneous moment, a moment there that, that's happening in, in the moment doesn't feel like a rote bit. So I started going in on this one guy who's a friend of ours about this thing that's happening at his hotel. And then he was laughing and I was teasing him and he started giving us information about what's really going on behind the scenes. And that got really funny and people started to laugh about it you know what i mean and uh and that was what people remember like no one remembers oh yeah those first 10 minutes were awkward they remember like oh my god that bit with you and walt was so funny and it was just i just so some people when things are going bad they do like they go into the crowd they do crowd work or most of the time you just keep going and you try and get them back like oh god damn who was it there was a comic who died who was really really brilliant who used to say, if you're bombing, just say the most honest thing you can think at the, at the time, which is an, an interesting perspective because the point is what people think they're coming to a comedy show to laugh. But the truth is that's not why they're there. They are there to experience something. They're there to experience a moment. They're to experience, to have an experience. And if you're like truly honest and you mean what you say, that's really where the funny part, where they're laughing. They're laughing and you're like, having a really a real moment a real honest moment and you try and create that with the with the jokes or if something really happens spontaneously in the audience and they're there to experience it they're there to experience that moment do you understand what i'm saying they think they're there to laugh but that's not really why they're there does that make sense? how much yeah how much fun was it doing the real wonder woman skit for the real wonder woman uh Gail oh Godot, on jimmy fallon that was that was really something we had planned it that was planned so long like years before we did it i had been doing the wonder woman dance bit which i still do occasionally uh here we go about oh one yeah there's the tape of it yeah so about i don't know how many years ago this was like 2015 16 17? i forgot what year this was but i've been doing this bit since oh one Jimmy and I went on tour. We did a little comedy tour in 2014 or 15. And I did this, I did the dance in the tour. And he was like, one day we'll do this on the show whenever there's a new Wonder Woman to film. This was like three years before we did it. <laughs> and then when we did it, Gal didn't know we were gonna do it. It was a total surprise. We surprised her. Jimmy was like, no, we're going to play Box of Lies, and whether she wins or loses, you're going to come out and dance no matter what happens. So she was such a good sport about it. She thought it was funny, and you know, she wanted to take pictures. But that was like, the, that's yeah, that's the climax pretty much of that bit. I don't know how much higher or crazier that bit can get. That's pretty yeah. much it. It's been funny to see that, and it's yeah. just, uh, I wonder, did you ever hear from Linda Carter her, uh, if she mm. thought how, what she thought of it? No, no. I, the other, the other thing, I, the other another level with is there's another dance bit I do that's like a James Bond spoof. So I'm, I, I did it at the Big Slick of uh, 2019. I'm naked behind a sheet, and I'm backlit, so you see my outline. And Live and Let Die comes on, and then so it's like was the this beginning. a Hasidic James Bond? No, no, no. Okay. no there's no, there's no hole in the sheet, <laughs> and so I'm backlit. Like you see at the beginning of every Bond film, there's like the silhouettes of like the naked women swimming around in the water or whatever. 
So it's sort of like that, but it's a naked me. And I'm doing these crazy dances, and the dances get sillier and sillier. It's like Live and Let Die is a song that has like seven songs within the song. So the tempos change and da da da, and it gets faster and slower and faster and slower. And it's a really silly, funny bit. I've been trying very hard to get Paul McCartney to see this video. <laughs> I've given it to a lot of friends who know Paul McCartney to say, show him this thing. So I don't know if he's seen it or not, but I want to do that bit at a Paul McCartney show. Well, I know Paul watches us and listens on all of our podcasts yeah. uh, on Spotify and everywhere that we are. But we do have to pay some bills, but I'm very excited for you to see the network debut of this commercial, which I put a lot of time and effort into last night here, uh, shot it all by myself. Uh, so we'll get your opinion on it and uh, pay some bills at the same time here. Hi again, everybody. Dave Stevens here for Manscaped. And you know, what you see on the outside isn't always what you get down below. And what's the best way to get rid of all this unwanted stuff below the waist? <laughs> By using the complete line of Manscaped products to get rid of all that unwanted, unsightly hair from down below. That's because Manscaped has come out with the Performance Package 4.0. Inside this set, you'll find their Lawnmower Waterproof 4.0 Trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear, Nose, and Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to hold all your goodies. So, if you want to get rid of this, or you can look like this, thanks to these amazing Manscaped products. And if you check out now and enter the code GSS Show, you save 20%. So go to manscaped.com, your boys will thank you, and the significant others in your life will be happy too. All right. I love that. All I could think was, who put you on the table? Oh, well, I did. I just climbed up, you know. You climbed so, up yourself. Uh, like, I shot it. Uh, you know, my legs are still sitting over there next to the wall. I hadn't had them out of mothballs in eight or nine years. Uh, you know, those are the kind of zany things that I always do. Is I've always said, if people are going to stare at me, I might as well give them a show. But, uh, you know, we, we are so happy with Manscaped. You know, they support now the GSS show. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, an amazing product. <laughs> they do uh, a lot of good for men and they've got some amazing stuff here in fact troy they sent us so much stuff like we've got the uh the preserver that is uh, the deodorant for your testicles mm -hmm. we've got the uh crop reviver now i'm not making this up it's it, it smells good it looks good and of course uh the products that that do the trimming and all that kind of stuff that that did all the clipping and no i did not lose my legs thanks to manscape but uh it's a, it's a it's a great product and 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 as you saw on the ad right now if you throw in the code uh, gss show you get 20 percent off and free shipping and uh, troy i know you got him it kind of shocked you a little bit uh yeah. you don't have to endorse endorse this seth but uh, i wondered what you I thought of that yeah I all done on my cell phone too yeah I seth you're all balls anyways right <laughs> I'm all balls. I'm all balls. If you've ever seen anything, what's happening down here, it's literally 75% balls. Um, I, I love that they came up with every possible pun and phrase you could use for trimming or scaping oh. or ever. Like there's like a thousand puns in that ad. Yes. And then, and, and I mean, I just saw, um, uh, the, um, he just broke up with a Kardashian, um, Pete Davidson. Pete, Pete Davidson yeah. is 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 the spokesman for Manscaped too. So what a oh. what a perfect thing. So anyway, let's get back to uh, our guest tonight, Seth Herzog, joining yeah. us. And uh, Seth, I want you know you talk about the relationship with Jimmy Fallon and yeah. you know the things you've done with Conan and <laughs> and just looking at like this little thing here. I mean, how did that relationship start? And and what's it like to just be friends with, with you know a, a, a comic funny, genius? That's the funny little montage you put together. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jimmy's a wonderful guy. I've never met a harder worker. His mind is always working a thousand percent, you know, like 160 miles an hour. He has ideas all the time and fun, just really, really, really fun guy. We met, I mean, it's a long story, but I'll try and keep it short. We originally, originally, originally met in the, early, in the mid, late 90s, right before he got on Saturday Night Live, actually, the first time. I had a casting director friend um, who was actually a friend from camp, and now she was a casting director, and she called me in for stuff all the time, like sitcoms mostly. And then she called one day out of the blue, and she said, oh, my God, we just met the funniest guy. He's so funny. He's so charming, so good-looking. He's hilarious. I'm like, why are you calling to tell me this? Why are you calling to tell me you met someone funnier than me? 
And then it's like, we think you guys should be friends. So we're going, so me and Bonnie Finnegan, her, the other casting director she worked with, are going to see him do stand up tonight. You should come with us. So I went with them. It was Jimmy was doing a showcase for Abrams, which he was with at the time. He did a set. We met briefly after the show. And then, um, but we didn't like, it didn't stick or anything. We just met in passing. And then we had met literally in passing for years after he got on Saturday Night Live. We'd meet at parties and we'd chat, but he never quite you know, remembered me, but it wasn't until I did a Stella video. I did a short video with the uh, show author and Dave Wayne and Mike Black, who I was good friends with. And he loved my bit in this, in the Stella video. And that's when we became friends. And that's when he put like a name to a face and we started hanging out a lot. And then when we did late night, when late night started, he was like, you got to be my warm up guy. You got to do it. You're the, you're the guy, you're the best guy for it. And then I started on the show and I've been doing bits on the show ever since and doing the, the comedy before the show starts every single day. For well, 13 years. Speaking of friends, we thought mm -hmm. uh, that we would surprise you with uh, a blast, I guess, from your past, but also still currently in your life. A uh, buddy of yours, uh, Michael Brodsky. Brodsky. Who's an author. Oh, <laughs> my Lord. How you doing, man? Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, I, if you guys you know, which is funny that we went to theater camp together. Yes. And, and here is an embarrassing <laughs> photo right? of uh, so we, we that, that experience, was, right? Oh, that's not embarrassing. That was a highlight. <laughs> Is that before the bar mitzvah? Um, 84? Uh, two, yeah. three months before. Yeah, I seen your bar mitzvah video, and I think you were oh, still no. wearing that sweater. Yes. That's the yes, same I sweater? No, I, no, that's funny. If that's 84, it's a year after. It's a year after the bar, the bar mitzvah. Well, um, thank you, uh, Michael, for joining us. And Michael, I know, you know, uh, how did you guys meet and why are you still friends or why are you not friends? <laughs> uh, um, we met at camp. Well, we met at State Shore, right? Right, Seth? I mean, you know, before I got there, I got there in 1972. He started, like we both. I was there the year before. right? What's that? So, no, we both went to 85. You were there from 81 to 85. 81 to 85, yeah. Yeah. 81, 80, I was there for five, five. summers. And they and give out awards banner. if you do well. And you also give out an award if you're there for five years. The, the biggest award you get is the five year award. That's the biggest award you could get if you've lasted for five summers. I only did <laughs> four. So I, I missed that out. You missed it. You missed, missed the five, the five years. It. It's like a giant thing. Did you um, keep Stage Road was fun. I mean, I'm still friends with. Most of those guys, like Josh Charles and, and uh, John Sherman yeah. and Adam Mornoff and all those guys, are still my great friends. That's what I was just curious, it was, curious it was, about. I mean, the, yeah. So when you think that stage door manner training on what, what do you remember? What is it that's your career? What is it that's what? It's had an impact on your current career. Career? I would say, honestly, the biggest impact of, of camp is the 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 work ethic you are you are thrown into that you can't shy away from. Like at this theater camp, and you have to, and if you're really into musical theater, you should go. Um, but it's but it's very intense. You do like three classes in the morning, then you're in two plays that you rehearse simultaneously. You know, there's a major production and a a, a, a mini production they call it. And uh, so there's yep. like, you're constantly working. You're in three classes and two shows at the same time. So like right. the thing that sort of kept me up is that like, you have to be great all the time and you work all the time. Like you don't, you don't, you can't slack. And this is your lines for today and they better be brilliant. <laughs> you know? Well, at least look right. at all these years later, you're still, you're still, uh, you guys are still together, still friends. Now what's that <laughs> in your hand, Michael, for our, our listeners at home, they can't I'm see you're holding up some oh, pamphlets play, or something. Playbills. Playbills for when you do a show, you get a playbill. Seth, Seth was in. Seth was in. By was I in that, Heidi? That's what, that's what it says here. I played, you know I played? You, I had a teeny part. I had a teeny part in that, Heidi. I was Eric the organ grinder. Wow. You guys didn't wow. interrupt a football game or anything while you were doing that show, did you? <laughs> we probably time. Sure we there was, yeah. There was no end. Going on in that. There was no sports at this camp. In fact, in the camp there's, video, yeah. there's like a, a montage of people playing sports, and it's the kitchen staff. 
<laughs> are you alluding to it's tough to name a Jewish athlete other than Sandy Koufax, or what are you talking about here? <laughs> I'm just talking about there was a tennis court and a basketball court, and no one ever used them. <laughs> well, Michael, uh, what's yep. that? Is that is that birdie? I was in that birdie. Yeah, yeah, you were in that. I won an right. award for that. No, that was the only thing I got nominated for that didn't win. Was that? How about Gypsy? Gypsy? We're gypsy, sorry. let me tell you something. This is a crowning achievement. I had two parts in that Gypsy pr pr production. I had a part in Act 1, a part in Act 2, and I won an award for both. I won two awards for that season for two different parts. Nice. And I'll, I'll, I think my life peaked at that point. How about Cabaret? Cab I was in Cabaret. Cabaret. It was my last show I did there. It was the last show I did there in Cabaret. I was uh, Ernst the Nazi. And it was really funny. I end act one singing Tomorrow Belongs to Me, which is this Nazi theme song, to a sea of Jewish parents in the audience who lived through <laughs> World War II. And the looks on their faces were priceless. I, I, this little Jewish boy sings Tomorrow Belongs to Me at the end of act one to silence. No one clapped. <laughs> They were kind of like this show, right? Like yeah, this show, similar, yeah, yeah. similar, similar. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. A couple more, just uh, and no, 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 net. No, no, net was one of my first shows. That was my first show in '82 with um, Adam Mornoff was in that with me, who was my roommate and great friend, and and Smurf was in that. We were just chorus boys. Mm -hmm. We were chorus boys and no, no, net. We had the best time, the best right. time, just being stupid because we didn't have anything to do. Better being you, the, than you altar guys boys, were, I guess, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What's that, Mike? About when you think about our time, time there, I mean, with, yeah. With, and uh, it, the friend, but, but um, Jack, Jack Romano and Jack. Jack Romano was such a character, and I wish there was more information on him you could find. He was this little Cuban gay Cuban. fireball. <laughs> who always was smoking advantages constantly, constantly smoking. And he yelled at us. He was like the artistic director of the camp. And he treated all these 12 and 13 year olds like we were 35 year old Broadway professionals. So he was just constantly throwing chairs and yelling at us. These 11 year old kids are on stage. He's like, what the fuck do you think you are doing on stage? You look like a fucking idiot. Do something. Okay. 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 Constantly. Like this is like, he said so many dirty, terrible things to kids who were like 11 and 12 who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> he was treating us like we were like like 45-year-old pros, like constantly yelling and throwing chairs. Right. Constantly. <laughs> it was insane. Right. Training and, uh, you know, certainly the whole experience. So you got He scared us into being good. Like half the reason you were good is because you didn't want Jack to yell at you. So like you That's were right. like, I'm going to do the best performance and reach in, in deep in my soul and be amazing because I don't want Jack to throw a chair at my face. <laughs> well, thank you, Jack. And Michael, thank you for joining us. We're, we apologize for your audio issues, but we are going to have you back on the show down the road. Right. You've got your yes. book coming out. What's your if book, we can Mike? Hear you? Fourth Down and Dam Alignment Story is told by Mike Brodsky. And I think 29th, I'll be on with Leon Sir. C4 Leon Searcy's book and, and amazing. Jaguars. All right, Michael. Thanks you. We'll get your audio fixed thank, for next time. Thank but you. thank you for joining us. And uh, we got to pay some more bills. Uh, oh, just no. real quick here. Hey, you know that's what we do in the show. So you know, if you'd like twenty percent off the world's softest, comfiest, best fitting men's clothes. Well, Fresh Clean Threads has your back and your front and your sides with everything from tees to tanks and Henleys to polos and pullovers and hoodies. Get designer quality basics without paying ridiculous prices. Confidence shouldn't cost a fortune. Go to freshcleanthreads.com, freshcleanthreads.com. Use the special code GSS show for 20% off your order. I'm dancing because I look so good in these clothes. I've got another one on right here. And again, they are really nice. So thank you to our sponsors. Your Amazing. perfect fits await. So uh, we got those things out of the way as we continue our friend, our new friend, Seth Herzog. And uh, we're apologize for the audio uh, having your buddy on. But, uh, you know, it's nice to see that those friendships that you had and you've had to continue in your life with comedians and things like that. Is there other comedians that we don't know about you're really close to that uh, would shock us? <laughs> I don't know who would shock you. And I don't know what you think of me. 
<laughs> I mean, um, I ran into our other friend here, Troy, at um, in KC at the Big Slick. Yeah, we're uh, going to get that into that in a second here. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, Paul Rudd and I are old friends, and he got me involved in that. And I knew actually Sudeikis and Riggle from years before that. Our mutual friend York. David Keckner and Keckner. You know, those guys. Well, I yeah. met Keckner doing the charity event. I didn't know him before that. But Riggle and I knew through doing stand up, and, and I met Sudeikis like right before he became a cast member or that August. And then we did a movie together, actually. And then we became buddies. And he started doing I, I do the show Sweet, this big monthly show in New York City. The next one's this coming Tuesday at the Chelsea Music Hall. But it used to be weekly. I used to have to do this whole event weekly. And, and Riggle and Sudeikis uh, and Brud have all been a part of it a lot. Um, okay. Yeah. So, well, speaking of Big Slick, you've been a supporter and a, become a regular now. Uh, yeah. Just talk about how much fun uh, you have when you uh, come back to Kansas City and how much it means uh, for you to visit a hospital and supporting this great charity with Children's Mercy Hospital. I knew very little about it. Before. I mean, I knew about it because it had been around for like four, four or five years before Paul asked me to come and be involved. And I knew that it was just like this big, fun weekend. I didn't really know too much about the hospital part of it until I got there. And then you realize you have to go to the hospital as part of the thing. You got to, you know, you should visit the kids. And you visit the kids, and it's like it's such a profound experience. And these like kids who are like have these undefined cancers that are like very rare and they can only this is the only place that really handles that you know and there's all these like and then no one ever pays for anything so like everyone is is just there from all different backgrounds like in a lot, a lot of poor kids you know um and it's really it's really bonding like i gotta tell you there's a whole group of us that go every year and we're only together for two days a year but like we really feel close to each other like it's a real, it's a, it's an immense two days, 48 hours where you're like together for 48 hours, trauma bonding basically, or having like a, a lot of fun. Like you go to the hospital and then you do like, there's a big baseball game. You do a softball game together. And then you, there's, we, we do some sort of, uh, we watch the other game. Then we do some drinking. And then the next day there's usually a bowling tournament and then there's a big show at night. So there's like a lot happening with each other at once. Anyway, um, it's really fun. And I'm really glad I, and it's one of the most thing. And, important and fun things I do every single year. And they make me perform every year. And I have to, and now the, the Kansas City community is expects me to do something crazy every year. And I have to up it every time. It's hard. It's hard. I think I've, I think I've maxed out on things to do. I've done every trick in the book I have at that Spe show. Well, speaking of kids, you got two twins of your own. Uh, how is that uh, raising uh, two twins? And oh. are, you, are you gone nuts yet or? <laughs> I, um, you know what's funny? I always think about this. It was really hard the first year. When you have babies, like two babies that are crying at you all the time, like it's really hard. It's like impossible. Like even with my wife and we had a lot of help, it still was really hard. And I always thought to myself, why? And it got easier as time goes on, especially when they become three. Now they're three. And it's like they walk around. They have opinions. They can dress themselves. They can go to the bathroom by themselves. Like it's so much easier than it was the first year. And I was like, why would God, nature, make the hardest year the first year? Wouldn't they make that the easiest year and it gets harder as you go on? Why would it do it backwards? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, they're really fun and they say funny stuff, weird stuff all the time. Like we were watching Sesame Street yesterday and one of my three-year-olds goes, talking about one of the Muppets, he goes, is she wearing a wig? It's like, how do you describe whether a Muppet's wearing a wig or not? Like, yes, no. I am not wearing a wig. I am Super Grover. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> it's all fake hair anyway. What's Nothing's real about this. I don't know why you think is they wearing a wig. Um, uh, yeah, they say all sorts of my stuff. One of them, so Kieran, the same one asked the other day, is uh, asked me very prof like profoundly, is God a, uh, a stranger? Because we've been talking about strangers, like not talking to people you don't, you don't know. And she asked if God was a stranger. And I was like, yes. If someone says they're God, <laughs> someone comes up to you and says they're God, they're definitely a stranger. What if God was one of us? Yeah, exactly. And they've heard that song. They like that, they like that song. They're into that song. <laughs> Which is, I think what came from that question came out of listening to that song. They're like, wait a minute. What if I did see God in a bus? Should I say hi? Next up is who's this Santa Claus guy? Because we're getting ripped off on the Hanukkah presents, right? Like, you know? <laughs> no, they're very... 
even though we live in kind of a Jewish house, they are very aware of Christmas and they get a lot of Christmas gifts. Awesome. Well, <laughs> as we wind up, uh, I, I did want to ask you, uh, you know, you, you've done so much and let's say we were having a beer, or taking some ayahuasca or something together. And I wanted to ask you like, what is your, is that go-to highlight or a moment for you in your career? Was it Conan? Was it Jimmy? Is it something that would be obscure South by Southwest? Like there's that, like that Super Bowl yeah. moment for you. I would say the year 2019, I hit four big goals. That was like a big year for me right before the pandemic was I, I opened for the final Beastie Boys show ever. They did a, I don't know if you know, they did like a talking tour that became the show on Apple TV where they tell their whole story. So at the last show, they needed a comic and I ended up doing it for different reasons. I was going to be there anyway. I'm friends with those guys. And they're like, you should, you're going to be there anyway. You might as well do it. So open for the final Beastie Boys show. Um, I did the Thanksgiving day parade with Jimmy on a float. I always wanted to be on a float in Thanksgiving day parade. Uh, I performed the big slick. That, that's what it. this was. That's then, what right? that is. That's, that's yeah. that. So yeah. So I finally was on a float on the Thanksgiving day parade. Um, I, the big slick was at an arena. That was the first time at the at and arena. It's the first time I performed in, an, in like a basketball arena size audience. And I did a Christmas show with Bill Murray that in 2019. That was really fun. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's so, a pretty good year. Jones and her band, the um, Puss in Boots with Sasha Dobson and uh, spacing everyone's name. Anyway, um, Catherine Cat Popper. They have a band and they do a Christmas show. And the one in 2019, they always have special guests. And they were like, Seth, do you want to be a special guest and do a bit? And I was like, yeah, of course. But the only other special guests were Bill Murray and Mankind, the wrestler dressed as Santa Claus. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Just the three of us. So they're doing their songs, like Puss in Boots is doing their songs. And Bill Murray and Mankind and I are backstage making small talk while Mankind's in a full Santa outfit. <laughs> it was so absurd. I heard you do a really great Bernie Sanders impersonation. Do you have any other uh, impersonations you do? And can we hear the Bernie Sanders? <sighs> Bernie is really one of the better ones. And I don't do it much because I haven't done it on stage in a while. But uh, the Bernie joke is basically I, I talk about how I love watching him give speeches because the way he gives a speech, it always looks like he's typing out what he's saying with one finger at a time on the typewriter, like an old timey typewriter and he's using one finger. Like we have a revolution here from the ground up next sentence. And then he hits the old sidebar on the next <laughs> sentence. <laughs> and then that's how he goes. He knows he's going to the next thing. You know, we got to go, we got to get these people. We have to uh, go after the 1% and tell them what we need to do with our own agenda. And I love, he always says agenda a gender like so brooklyn that he has an r at the end of every word that has an a uh it, it warms my heart he's and, like and a you, grumpy you, old grandpa and and you need these guys to live longer like trump and bernie so you have new <laughs> fresh material right like bernie yeah. sitting there in a bad sweater you know and they make fun of yeah. his mittens and right I'll, i mean i'll definitely come up with other bits you know but i definitely hope they live forever <laughs> All right, as we wrap up, are you on the road? Tell us about your podcast. How can people see you? You've got so much stuff online that so I got to see. Stuff. I was amazed. It's a lot on my website. I have a new website up. It's actually at thesethherzog.com. And um, I have, you know, Sweet, my big monthly show, August 18th at the Chelsea Music Hall. It's August 16th, sorry, the Chelsea Music Hall. The next one's September 20th at the Chelsea Music Hall. Um, that's the 45th anniversary of the death of Elvis Presley, by the way. I hope you know, August 16th. So I didn't know that celebrate, celebrate that or come up with some comedy. I'll do a bit. I'll do a bit about it. I used to, I used to live in Memphis. We didn't even discuss that. Um, what else am I, I there's not many touring much going on, but the sweetest pod is the podcast and you can go to the sweetest pod.com and listen to the episodes that are up. We got Questlove has an episode. There's one with Jerry O'Connell and Justin Long. And there's one with Dion Flynn, and I got a Nora Jones one coming up, and a Rachel Feinstein one coming up. That's fun. 
Well, thanks, man. Thanks for taking the time out. It was it was great to have you. It's it's yeah. nice to meet you, and I, you I hope to stay in touch and just to watch you continue to blossom as that guy in 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 entertainment. We all know that's that guy. I know he's in this 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 and this, and they're like it's uh, Charles Hurt Hertzig or Charles Brian Hertzig, Herzog yeah. Sean, or you know Sean something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Troy. Blast, final guys. final Any, thoughts, anytime. Troy. Um, yeah, I appreciate you joining us tonight, Seth. I know you're busy, and like I said, you got a couple of twins to chase around. But um, your next show, hopefully, people go out and see it because uh, you are a funny guy. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. Hey, you're very funny, and we appreciate you being a part of us. We appreciate our sponsors for Manscaped Pro Stance over my shoulder here. We got uh, FanDuel coming up and Fresh Clean Threads, which I look good in, of course. You guys, the people that listen and find us on Spotify and all the podcasts and place out there, continue to share our word, our show, everything. And again, with all of our sponsors and the the code GSS, you can save money on shirts and shaving your testicles and all kinds of good stuff. So thanks, everybody, for being a part of our show. This is Dave Stevens. We got Chuck Knobloch coming up. We got Hugh Jackson, head coach of Grambling and a former NFL coach to talk about a lot of stuff. So continue to follow Geary, Stein, and Stevens. Until next time, America, aloha.